work and learn. Meet light, meet max. Sakliya karagani mata my SLT app ke log bina. Work and learn. Meet light, meet max. Sakliya karagani mata my SLT app ke log bina. Dasan kanti chune sahit live aish dantale pe. Dabtole ati prasne dhaya palakai. headlines tonight similar ideology samagi janabalavegya parliamentarian dr harsha de silva says he is confident sri lanka would rise from the crisis if president ranil wickrama singha is surrounded by people of the same ideology and if i knew his there is hope country circle far worse than us have risen Debt burden. Sri Lanka's per capita debt shoots up 257% to nearly 800,000 rupees per individual between years 2010 and 2021. Blue Finance. Senior economist at ADB Institute says Sri Lanka can focus on opportunities for developing ecotourism and coastal conservation as blue financing projects. Tourism is going to bounce back anyway as the pandemic proceeds. Tax lifted. All duties on imported raw material for locally manufactured sanitary napkins waved off and importers of finished napkins will get zero rate of VAT. All this and much more coming up tonight, this Sunday, the 2nd of October, 2022. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. A warm welcome joining you tonight on First at Nine. I'm Hindi Mary Amuwatta. Now, what is the debt burden of an average citizen in Sri Lanka? According to a special audit report on financial management and public debt control in Sri Lanka, during the period from 2018 to 2022, Sri Lanka's per capita debt shot up by 257% between the year 2010 and 2021. Accordingly, per capita debt stood at 793,888 rupees, or an average citizen is in debt of nearly 800,000 rupees by the end of year 2021. The Auditor General recently released a special report on financial management and public debt control in Sri Lanka from 2018 to 2022. According to the report, as at the 31st of December 2018, total local and foreign debt of Sri Lanka stood at 67.92 billion US dollars or 12,030.5 billion rupees. Total debt increased to 12,589.3 billion rupees or 87.75 billion US dollars as at the 31st of December 2021. Meanwhile, debt per capita has shown a sharp increase of 257% between 2010 and 2021, standing at 793,888 rupees per capita by the end of 2021. The report also highlighted that the mandate of the central bank and the treasury pertaining to their responsibilities in public debt management isn't governed by any appropriate legal documents leading to the lack of accurate information on the total debt owed by Sri Lanka as at a particular moment along with its composition. Expanding on the matter, the Auditor General's report stated that the total liabilities incurred to construct the Hambantota port have not been accurately reflected in either the treasury report or the Ports Authority annual report. Furthermore, the Auditor General reported that no consideration was shown regarding the credit ratings downgrade by the international credit rating agencies, while also no productive measures were taken to rectify the situation. The report also mentioned that according to the IMF's 2019 review, new fiscal rules and the establishment of an independent public debt management agency will assist in ensuring sustainability of public debt. The report also mentioned that according to the IMF's 2019 review, the new fiscal rules and the establishment of an independent public debt management agency will assist in ensuring sustainability of public debt. 
Although the report acknowledged that revenue could be collected through an expansion of the tax base and improvement of compliance, especially in the year 2020, it also stated that tax revisions in late 2019 went against the guidelines set in the IMF review of 2019. U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka Julie Chung says Sri Lanka's investment framework environment needs to improve to attract foreign investments into the country. Addressing the 30th Annual General Meeting of the American Chamber of Commerce recently, the U.S. Envoy said investment red tape needs to be reduced while a good regulatory framework is required in the island. Central Bank Governor Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe, meanwhile, gave an assurance that measures have been taken to achieve medium to long-term sustainable solutions for the growth of the country. President Rikrama Singh highlighted the importance of trade and investment in Sri Lanka's economic recovery and his desire to tap into foreign direct investment. Now for this to be successful, the business environment and investment framework environment need to improve. It's important to reduce red tape and make sure that there's no unreasonable obstacles to investors as they look for opportunities here in Sri Lanka and bring in the foreign capital that the country desperately needs. Concerns about consistency and transparency in government decision making and above all a lack of predictability are the primary reasons American firms and all foreign firms tell us why FDI has not grown faster. What our companies want is a level playing field, a good regulatory framework, trust that their arbitration and their contracts will be honored. When you have that kind of strong investment climate, then companies will want to come. We are proud to have already provided nearly $400 million in financing to Sri Lanka's private sector, and we are eager to expand this support. The United States remains a friend and partner for Sri Lanka's prosperity. So I look forward to watching Sri Lanka not only survive this economic crisis, but thrive and become stronger. We hope that with this strong reform programs and our ability to implement political difficult and painful economic reforms in these difficult times, we certainly will get through this process. And obviously when you face a economic crisis, there are a lot of pains all over the places and even all the sectors, businesses and only area or business that can at least survive at this point is only people who are earning for an exchange. That is where the export access is, is quite valuable at this time. And other businesses we also recognize these are difficult times and in my view it's only a, a short term temporary thing and so we are, whole intention is to go through a painful process process is for us to get back to a medium term, long term sustainable solution so that we can get back to and realize the potential of Sri Lanka's growth. If you do the things, for example, necessary structural reforms that would enhance the growth potential of the country and also do the proper institutional reforms and strong institutions is the key for a long term successful economic growth in any country and this is true for even for Sri Lanka that is where I think a lot of reforms we need to do the public institutions, the judiciary, uh, the independence of certain institutions. Foreign Minister Ali Sabri welcomed possible Australian investment to energy and education sectors in Sri Lanka during his meeting with Australian High Commissioner in Colombo, Paul Stevens. In another meeting between the Sri Lankan Foreign Minister and the Vietnamese Ambassador in Colombo, the potential for expansion of cooperation in a number of areas were discussed. Minister of Foreign Affairs, President's Council Ali Sabri met with the newly appointed Australian High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, Paul Stevens, at the ministry premises where the two parties discussed possible investments from Australia to Sri Lanka. The Australian High Commissioner has spoken of the possibility of investment from Australia in Sri Lanka's energy and education sector. While appreciating the recent immediate humanitarian assistance extended to tackle domestic challenges in Sri Lanka, Foreign Minister Sabri welcomed investments from Australian companies to Sri Lanka. The discussion also focused on a range of bilateral issues, including matters of mutual interest at the multilateral level. In another meeting, Ambassador of Vietnam to Sri Lanka, Ho Thi Than Truck, called on the Sri Lankan Foreign Minister. They discussed the potential of both Sri Lanka and Vietnam to expand mutual cooperation in a number of areas. The meeting also focused on the strong cooperation between the two countries in terms of political, social, cultural and educational fields. 
parliamentarian of the Samagi Janabalavege, Dr. Harsha Deserva says, President Ranul Vikramasinghe needs people of the same ideology to surround him in order to develop the nation. He went on to say that Vikramasinghe's appointment as president is legitimate regardless of what people may say and said that he was confident that Sri Lanka would come out of the crisis just like countries that were far worse than Sri Lanka have risen. There is hope. Countries that were far worse than us have risen. We can do it. We will do it. We have to focus our attention on the job. We have to walk a tight rope. We can't fall down. We have to have the right people to run this country. Taxes imposed on imported raw material for locally manufactured sanitary napkins and finished products have been waived off in order to make hygiene products more affordable for women and girls in Sri Lanka. President Ranul Wickremesinghe has directed authorities to thereby pass down the benefit to consumers. The President's office said manufacturers should get the recommendation from the Secretary to the Ministry of Industries to receive tax concessions at the import stage of raw material. According to the President's Media Division, customs import duty of 15%, CES duty of 10% to 15%, and the Port and Airport Development Levy of 10% have been waived off on importation of five raw materials and import of intermediate goods, while locally manufactured central napkins and imported ones are given zero VAT rate. Heeding to the requests made by local manufacturers, the government has also taken measures to waive off duties imposed on five raw materials for locally produced sanitary napkins in order to make hygiene products more affordable. Following these concessions, the price of a pack of 10 sanitary napkins produced locally will be reduced by 50 to 60 rupees and the maximum retail price of a pack will be around 260 to 270 rupees. Additionally, consumer retail prices of imported finished products will be reduced by around 18% or 19%. Will the benefit of reduction in fuel prices pass on to the people? Let's find out when we return after this break. I know, I know, puta. Hey, baby, I get the need. I need me. I'm out to tell it. Kalagunya ko huna. Rhino nang walada safe tamay mulu getherama. Rhino cement roofing sheets. Then you know, Rhino. I know. Big three. Uber eats magin idripat karan adrein. Avashita atya at atya avashabhand paritaga kirimur baby kava. Although petrol prices were reduced uh, at midnight yesterday by both the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation and Lanka Indian Oil Company, three wheeler operators say they're unable to reduce fares unless the government increases their fuel quota. Private bus owners, however, say they can reduce bus fares of if fuel prices of diesel are brought down. 
With effect from midnight yesterday, state fuel supplier the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation reduced prices of their 92 octane and 95 octane petrol products by 40 rupees and 30 rupees respectively. With that, the new price for a litre of 92 octane petrol will be 410 rupees, while a litre of octane 95 will be 510 rupees. However, the prices of auto diesel and super diesel did not see a revision. Further, private fuel supplier Lanka IOC too reduced their prices of petrol in line with the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation prices. Although both CPC and Lanka IOC reduced their prices of petrol, three wheel operators said today that they will continue the present fares without any reduction. Private bus owners, meanwhile, called for a reduction in prices of diesel. State Minister for Finance Ranjit Simbala Pitya categorically denied reports on social media that a planned salary cut for the state sector employees was to be effected. The State Minister for Finance pointed out that the government has not taken such decision but emphasised it is government responsibility to secure jobs of public servants. Perate, Masika, Rajasevaka, Vatupasandha, Bandagare, given a mudala, Rupial billion, Siak Koti, Anutuna. Visa Matupasandha, Rupial billion, Visia. Meleke Katu, Rupial billion, Ekasi Dahanamak, Maset. Make a Varshuka Balut, Rupial billion, Ekdas Harsi, Visiata. The Das Siake. Ape Mulu Raja Adamat, Pial billion, Edas Harsia, Panahakatasan of Mania. Mulu Raja Adamumapi, Vatupsaha, Visamat Santa Governor, Matamaki, Nemekitamat, Berarum Karna, Raja Sevaka, Vatup Adak Neme, Sialama, he went to take the my promote to the Hidartic Yaran Sidwe. Have I then? Egavin Naki in the Kaki and Puluan. Taking you to Business News, Senior Consultant Economist at the Asian Development Bank Institute, Peter Morgan says Sri Lanka can focus on developing ecotourism and coastal conservation as blue finance projects, although regulatory framework and monitoring will be essential to these projects. He made these remarks in response to a question with regard to governance essential for blue financing during a recent webinar hosted by the Centre for Banking Studies themed blue economy and blue finance opportunities for related industries in Sri Lanka. Is it that we need a dedicated agency that is managing the blue economy that can come up with those project profiles and uh, make it you know, attractive to investors by having the documentation and showing the returns? Or is this is something that the Ministry of Finance, External Resources Department or the Central Bank or other types of bodies or even the Board of Investment type of bodies can do? Or is this something that a private company needs to do? Two points. First, for example, in the case of fisheries, it was suggested that either a minister level body or at least something which is at least a, a separate institution within the ministry should have specific responsibility for that sector. But even then, you still need coordination with the, the Ministry of Finance and, and probably the central bank too. So what kind of governance do we need of a blue financial system? And, and also, what kind of regulatory system do we need around blue finances? First, establishing institutions where they don't exist currently. For example, in the case of tourism, in many cases, it's, it's relatively unregulated. So you, you need a, a regulatory framework for a coastal protection, coastal environmental protection. But in terms of uh, getting access to the blue finance, I think that's where coordination amongst the, the various ministries and the central bank and, and the regulators becomes more important. For, certainly, when it comes to blue finance type projects, you have to have monitoring of the projects. And that, that would, I think, require a regulatory framework, both for the initial issuance of the bonds and, and then for the monitoring of, of, of the actual results afterwards. Considering the current economic condition of Sri Lanka, 
what sort of projects would be cheapest to engage in? Right. Well, I think tourism is the obvious sector because tourism is going to bounce back anyway as the pandemic recedes. So efforts to, for example, promote ecotourism to, to sort of you know, strengthen the brand, to strengthen the environmental, the degree of environmental concern and attention to, to maintaining the environment and, or, or improving it would probably be the most likely uh, starting point. Can you consider debt for climate swaps within the blue economy financing mechanism? Debt for, for nature swaps are, are are definitely being considered these days. So, so again, it, it depends on, on how it's packaged, but uh, that that's certainly a possibility, yes. Basically, it's an in-kind sort of trade where in exchange for reducing the debt, you, you make a commitment to certain kinds of environmental targets, whether it might be uh, cleaner beaches or less pollution of various kinds. Obviously, that has to be measured, but uh, it's essentially that kind of exchange. So it's it's not a monetary exchange, but it's it's a it's it's basically a promise to improve the environment in some way, which would then up be used to to reduce the debt by that amount. The OPEC Plus will meet in Vienna at ministerial level on Wednesday to discuss future output strategy amid tumbling oil prices and economic contractions worldwide and recession fears. This will be the group's first in-person meeting since March 2020 when COVID-19 restrictions moved the meeting online. Reports suggest that OPEC Plus will consider an oil output cut of more than a million barrels per day. The figure is slightly above estimates for a cut given last week which ranged between 500,000 barrels per day and 1 million barrels per day. The output cuts are considered on the back of a slide in oil prices from multi-year highs reached in March and market volatility. Saudi Arabia, OPEC's de facto leader, first flagged the possibility of cuts to correct the market in August. The oil prices of both the West Texas Intermediate and Brent crude have dropped from peaks of over $120 a barrel in June to about $80 a barrel. Today, Brent crude futures stood at 85.57 US dollars a barrel, while WTI futures stood at 79.77 US dollars a barrel. Meanwhile, China's imports of Russian oil have rocketed from a very low base at the start of this year, reaching a peak in June and July, and largely maintaining these levels through to September. Although India's purchases of Russian oil have fluctuated this year, falling in February at the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, purchases rose significantly in the following months. Sri Lanka has also been taking advantage of discounted Russian oil with three shipments. At one point, Russian Urals crude was more than $30 a barrel cheaper than Brent crude. By the end of September, this was around $20 a barrel cheaper. Sri Lanka's national cricket team left for Australia this morning to participate in the ICC T20 World Cup which commences in Melbourne on the 16th and the champion will take home a 1.6 million US dollar check on the 13th of November. The Sri Lankan team will play three qualifying matches against Namibia, UAE and the Netherlands at Geelong in Melbourne as the two finishing teams from this round will qualify for the main tournament. The Sri Lankan team departed for Melbourne two weeks before the first qualifying game against Namibia on the 16th of October. Before the qualifying round, Sri Lanka has two practice games against Zimbabwe and Ireland. These matches will be very important to the national team in order to adjust themselves to the Australian conditions. Afghanistan, Australia, Bangladesh, England, India, New Zealand, Pakistan and South Africa are confirmed to start their tournament at the Super 12 stage. And that's all for tonight. Good night.